Hello, hello, Chris here with another episode of the Make It Podcast, and this is another Sunday special from the SWIFT Summit. This panel uh, includes myself and the wonderful Lauren Ponto from the Nashville Film Festival, and it is moderated by the equally wonderful and excellent Ava Lee Stewart. So please do enjoy. We talk about the best practices for navigating the film festival circuit. Enjoy. You're listening to Make It, a podcast by Bonsai Creative that helps creatives in film get where they're going faster by sharing the advice, knowledge, and insights of professional creatives across the film industry. I'm your host, Chris Barkley. I'll start with you, Lauren. Um, Do you want to, since we talked about it, you know, when you're a filmmaker and you're deciding which festivals to apply to, do you want to kind of talk about, you know, just a strategy, you know, just an idea about how to do a strategy for a film festival? Yeah. I mean, I'll ask before I go into it, like, are you guys filmmakers or aspiring filmmakers? Do you have work that you're looking to put out there currently? Cool. All right. Well, um, yeah, maybe inspiring. Sure. Um, so, you know, I think film festivals is, you know, it's a very large um, industry and there's many places you can start. Um, I think probably the worst thing you can do is just kind of start randomly submitting to festivals that you know of, um, particularly looking at kind of the different tiers of film festivals that are out there. So there's like the marquee film festivals, which are your Toronto, your Sundance, your South by Southwest, Venice can all those kinds of things. And then there's the regional layer of film festivals, which comes right under that. And Nashville actually falls in that category along with like Cleveland international film festival, Heartland and Indiana, Chicago, um, Palm Springs, um, uh, New Orleans film festival. I mean, I could go on, but, um, there's a lot of really great film festivals, um, in the South, um, and the Midwest. And I would say those are kind of like your regional, um, second tier. And then there's a tier below that. And that doesn't mean that they're, that they're not good. It's just, they're a little bit more niche. Maybe they only focus on one type of genre. For example, um, there's a lot of really amazing documentary film festivals out there. Um, hot docs, stock NYC, Um, those types of festivals are really, really amazing. And I would consider them a little bit more niche. Um, so when you're looking to submit to a film festival, I mean, definitely consider, um, you know, place and sort of the theme of your film. And does it, does it fit with, um, that type of festival? Like I said, some festivals are docs only, um, I think also, at least with the Nashville Film Festival, um, some things that we like to see might be a little bit different than, for example, what Chicago International Film Festival programs. I think just kind of based on where you are geographically, the programming can be different. Chicago, for example, I think a lot of their programming, um, you know, there's a lot of political programming. There's a lot of, uh, foreign dramas. That's what they specialize in. Whereas, you know, like Nashville, um, there's room to play with, uh, you know, magical realism, uh, quirky comedy, stuff like that. Um, so I do, and also just considering the, like the socio-political, um, environment, um, you know, race, all of that kind of stuff. I think there's, there's a festival for every film, but not, fi- not every film is right for every festival. So just remember that when you're submitting and, you know, don't get discouraged if something doesn't work out. Um, but film freeway is a platform that all festivals accept their films through. So, and it's kind of like a social network for film festivals and that you can really specify your research based on your specific project. So, yeah. well, and it would be maybe to add on to that kind of topic, it would be great to kind of give an idea to at least, uh, Christy, um, you know, 
how like the misconceptions of filmmakers about how they should interact, like how they should apply or if they should reach out overly, mm-hmm. just kind of like general etiquette, maybe. Yeah. Um, I mean, like I said, do your research. I think that's the first step. Um, it, it, as a filmmaker, like do your due diligence research. Where do you feel that your film would best, you know, have the chance to get in? It would fit in well with the audience and kind of, you know, the climate there and the community. Um, so that's the first step. Um, I would say, you know, the second step is, uh, making sure you sub- submit your film in the right category. For example, Nashville Film Festival has many different competitions um, from narrative feature to documentary feature, Graveyard Shift, which is like horror thriller, um, new directors, which is first time feature filmmakers. Uh, and sometimes people submit in the wrong category. It's a very common mistake. So I would just you know, if you, especially if you have a short too, we have a lot of shorts categories as to other festivals, just make sure you're submitting in the right category. Um, if you have questions, yeah, it's, it's great to reach out, um, to whoever is, you know, manning their entries inbox. Um, specifically if you have questions about like, oh, my film is, uh, you know, a sci-fi, uh, feature or short, like which, which genre sh- do you think I should submit to stuff like that is definitely questions you can ask. Um, and you, you can directly reach out to the, to the programmers and, you know, kind of champion your film and talk about its accolades where it might have played otherwise. Um, I, I think that always helps. I mean, you might not always get a response. It's not something that, you know, uh, programmers are like, um, they don't have to respond to it, but most of the time you'll, you'll probably get some sort of response, just thanking you for, you know, putting yourself out there, introducing yourself. I always like to hear from filmmakers and, you know, hear the passion behind the projects and what really went into the, into the film. So that's always good. I think another thing you should be careful about is asking for discounts or fee waivers. It's definitely a big thing that festivals, uh, that filmmakers do. And, um, while some festivals have different entries rules where they might not charge an entry fee at all, or they have an entry fee. Um, I would just be careful about asking for waivers. Um, something that I think not a lot of filmmakers know is like the entry fee is, um, essential to the overall operating budget of a film festival, especially nonprofit film festivals. And with the amount and volume of submissions that we get, um, that's the entry fee is going towards the time and attention it takes to go through all those entries and thoroughly watch a film from start to finish and then critique it. Um, so entry fees are necessary. Uh, I I would say, you know, if you're a nonprofit or you're submitting multiple entries, you might get a discount, but if you're just a a single filmmaker, just kind of reaching out to see if you can enter for free, it might not be the best thing. And I feel like there's a trend. I know that we kind of follow this, that, you know, if you grant someone an entry and not another person, you know, it's not as fair. So a lot of people are moving away from it anyway, Mm -hmm. just to, because, you know, to be balanced. Yeah, for sure. So Chris, would you like to maybe talk about, you know, any one project and how you, you put together a strategy? Yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. And if you don't mind, I'm going to reintroduce myself. Oh yes, please. Yeah. So that you, has some sort of value connected to why you're listening to me (laughs) for any reason. Uh, I'm Chris Barkley. I co-founded Bonsai Creative. We do branding and marketing specifically for independent film strategy and execution. We also have three feature films in worldwide distribution. We did a two year Netflix run with our film, All Light Will End. Uh, Two of our films are also on Paramount Plus right now. We have a five-star podcast called Make It. We have two books in the works. We do keynotes, panels across the country. So that's my uh, background. Uh, Two of the films that we did, uh, both won uh, Nashville Film Festival Audience Award. One of the films has the highest audience award score of all time. Uh, So super proud of that. Last but not least, I am on the board of Women in Film and Television. I am on the board of the Nashville Film Festival and I'm soon to be, I think, announced, I think I can say this, announced to be on the board of NPR and WPLN. So, Congratulations. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, it, um, the board stuff really quick, Ava, is just simply to connect and, and, and learn to make a bridge between all these nonprofits where, where we're not cannibalizing each other for the same pool. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. That'd yeah. Be, that's it's going to be really exciting for, for what we're doing here, yeah. doing the creative in Tennessee. So let's talk about strategy. Mm-hmm. Okay. First, do not submit to more than five festivals, no matter what. You're going to know if you have a winner or not. Is your film good or bad? You're going to know. You're going to know. Pick one that feels like a moonshot. Maybe it's Cannes. Maybe it's South by Southwest. Maybe it's Toronto. Pick one that's a moonshot. Then pick the rest based on what your goals are for the film. Now, if you're seeking distribution, you know why would you submit your film to uh, you know Laffy Taffy Online Film Festival dot com when there's not a, a buyer's market there? You know. The Nashville Film Festival is an Oscar qualifying film festival. That's a place where buyers are going to be. There's and going to be a market. Like it's, it's just the yeah. three categories. It's not the full, mm-hmm. the full game. Of, sure. Well, but, just so that, that's but, but, another good topic. Yeah. You know? yeah. So, Oscar qualifying, it doesn't always mean that it's every single category. It right. could mean that it's just a few. Yeah. So, you just need to be careful if you have a documentary and you want to enter an Oscar qualifying um, film festival that you would be able to, you know, your your documentary would be the category that they qualify. Well, you know, I look at it like this. If, if I'm a restaurant and I serve the best steak in the world and it's the only meat I have on my menu, meat eaters are still going to walk in, right? Yeah. Like you're still going to get those Michelin stars. So yeah, it's these different Oscar qualifying festivals have limited categories. Okay. But the buyers still come. Mm-hmm. It's still a market for that reason. Uh, so, I would say focus on, Lauren mentioned it, you do your research, you focus on the four or five you want to submit to and make sure that there's some opportunity for you to sell your film if your goal is to distribute. You know, if your goal is to get laurels, honestly, any festival will do. Mm -hmm. Go to any festival, whatever the lowest submission fee is. Try to win those things. You'll get a laurel just for being an official selection. And then you'll be able to put your movie poster and cover it with laurels and and your mom and dad will be super proud and all that stuff, right? So that's kind of how it works, right? Same thing uh, I experienced in music. Uh, it was like, do you want to make an album that gets you a record deal? Or do you want to make an album that has your face on the cover? <laughs> so you can show it to people. Well, and that's, I feel like that's the creative dilemma sometimes. Yeah. Because a lot of people make, you know, a passion project or an art house project it's like on the edge of several kind of categories because the industry, you know, it's a business. So, you know, you, it's like, if you're kind of outside of that or, you know, you're doing something that's outside of the box, super creative, you might not get as many acceptances because the programming, you know, and you can speak to that, like maybe isn't a fit for everybody. Mm-hmm. But I mean, in terms of like, like, let's say you had like a niche film that's like super specific, which is a great topic for like a documentary do you, do you guys have kind of like a theme you go with or do you, or do you just pick the best? Yeah. I mean, um, I think every year we have kind of a different, um, theme to our categories that are outside of competition. So I guess that's another thing to kind of specify is there's every festival has like set in stone competition categories that, you know, receive, um, jury viewing that, um, are eligible for an award. Um, whereas there's also, uh, placement at film festivals where, you know, they may be called like spotlight categories or, um, have a different name for the category. Um, it could be like spotlight documentaries that are like out of competition. Every festival has a different name for their out of competition features. And it doesn't mean that they're not as good as the films that are in the competitions. It's just kind of like the way the, the programming shakes out and how the puzzles put together of like, okay, for example, for this year, I am getting a lot of submissions, um, that are fantastic, but I can't fit them all into narrative feature. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, and a lot of them I'm noticing, um, have an element of like paranormal or magical realism. So I'm like, okay, I'd love to run with that and put together a program of like kind of ethereal dreamlike, scenes, um, for narrative feature films. And I think it just kind of depends on what you get each year. Um, but so to your, to your point, yeah, you on, curate it yeah. kind of based on the pattern of, of the content you're seeing. And, you know, when I was 
doing the program for our film festival, I noticed we, we did have some spotlight type categories mm-hmm. for the South and, um, we had less entries in those categories, which, what do you think in terms of, you know, filmmakers submitting, is that a good idea to really explore those spotlight categories? Yeah. I mean, I think for, at least for our film festival, and I think a bunch of other film festivals, it's not like when you go to submit, you're submitting for a narrative feature or you're submitting for, uh, the Tennessee competition or whatever, whatever feature you have, you're submitting for a certain competition, but it's then up to the programming team to like put together everything. And then if your film ends up in a spotlight category, that's kind of on the programmers end. you don't like submit to a spotlight category. Well, I guess, I guess maybe like a comp, like, you know, like the, like more specific categories, I guess. Like if you were doing something like, uh, like for instance, ours is a Southern spotlight. So if you have a film about the Southern United States that it qualifies for this category, but there aren't as many, it's a very specific mm-hmm. to- topic. But if your film qualifies for those types of categories, yeah. it might be like a really good thing for being able to get into the program. Oh, absolutely. Like, I, I understand what you're saying now. It's like, yeah, if you're a Tennessee filmmaker, um, submit to the Tennessee competition. Like, exactly. Yeah. I, it, and I think a, a huge misconception at many regional film festivals, cause every regional film festival yeah. has like a local competition. Right. And I think so many people think like, Oh, like I don't want to submit to local because it means like my film is less than or something like that because they have to program it. It's like, no, we, we program, um, everything we program, we, we stand behind and we want to show to an audience. So we're not going to programming we're not going to program anything we don't feel is of quality and that we don't like. Um, so if you're living in that state, submit to the local competition because those always get the biggest audiences have the most love and, um, you'll, you'll always end up having a great screening. Um, I'd yeah. love to amend to that too, you know, which is that, um, you know, to your point and, and, and you know, you still have to watch it, right. To right. know, Okay. Okay. We have a Southern category, right? Ava? So it's like, um, um, is it Southern? We have to watch it to know, is it Southern to, to, to put it? I know you, well, I know you, it's like, wrong categories. Yeah. I've right, had people right. enter like, like a two, one minute short as a feature document. Right. So I, I don't know. So it's yeah. just like a, you know, maybe just an accident on the computer. Or maybe they really thought that. I don't know. <laughs> they really thought exactly. Yeah. Ava, so it's, it's, so it's like what Lauren, to your point, everything has to be programmed. It still has to be watched. The quality of the film festival is incumbent upon how good the movies are that you select. So when you slack on that end of it, your festival is going to start getting worse in general. So I I think that's, I think it's a huge part. I would love to see, there's a festival in town called the Defy Film Festival, D E F Y. It's uh, run by Dicey Wildman and um, Billy Sinise. Yeah. And they're wonderful. And it's this great festival that, 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 uh, platforms the strangest movies in the world. Uh, everyone go out and watch the movie, uh, fetish. Uh, it's a short film. And then uh, let me know what you think. Uh, it has the, the most unbelievable ending of all time. But, um, I would love to see us maybe have, I know we do like the night block for shorts. Mm-hmm. It'd be cool to like partner with Dicey and say, let's do, the Defy block. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, yeah, I love And then I let, really like let Dicey mm-hmm. and Sarah Saturday and Billy Sinise, like, program just that block. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and that kind of, you know, in terms of, like, the local festivals, you know, with all of the things that just happened with COVID and it kind of the film festival role kind of changed a bit. It mm-hmm. came, became virtual and in person. Yeah. And uh, I feel like... Uh, with my festival, at least because it's hard to host a festival and not know if people could come, we were doing more like pop-up festivals, Mm -hmm. but in terms of like the pandemic, do you feel like the Nashville film festival or from your experience, Chris, do you feel like the role of the festival is changing and the way in which the festival is, is changing? Well, if you want to start, um, I I have a general thesis and, and feeling on this, which is, um, there is no replacement for being in person at a festival because it allows you to go deep with an individual. So we're all here in person. I just met these two folks right here in the back row. Uh, 
it wouldn't have been the same via Zoom. Right. It just wouldn't have been the same. I, 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 another lady I was sitting beside in the previous panel, uh, she's like, yeah, let's talk at the cocktail hour. We can do that because uh, we're in person. We can go deep. Problem is we can't scale, right? Those relationships, you have to really pick the person you're going to network with, go deep with them, and hope you're right. Mm-hmm. With the Zoom, with the, with the online festivals, what I found is if you had the gumption, if you had the courage to be the person who speaks on a Zoom call with 50 other people, you could scale your networking in a way that we've never experienced before at a festival. So uh, me uh, being uh, someone who has to face his fears that way, right, <laughs> in order to just run a business, I, I did that. You know, I said, hey, you know, I want to be part of the conversation. I threw my contact information in the chat. And then before I knew it, everyone was replying in turn. And I was able to add 30 names to my Rolodex in about 20 minutes. That's impossible in person. Mm-hmm. It just is. Because you'll be that awkward dude or gal that walks up to people already talking and then just kind of sidle in with your hands in your pocket. You're like, yeah. I'm part of the group. You're not. Uh, and you're being weird. So you can't, but on Zoom, you're not being weird. You're there for a reason. It's great. So there's pluses and minuses to yeah. it. Yeah. So in terms of like the Nashville Film Festival, did you, do you, did you make uh, like an online platform mm-hmm. and does it still exist in tandem because of travel restrictions, whatever yeah. might come up? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I completely, um, agree, uh, in that, like there's pros and cons to both of it. Um, 2020, we were completely virtual and, um, we actually were able to adjust and pivot really well. We had a very successful virtual festival. Um, we were still able to work with distributors. Um, our opening night film was the Bee Gees documentary on HBO. (laughs) If you haven't seen it, you should watch it. Um, it's amazing. Um, we had a virtual tribute to the soundtrack from Oh Brother, Where Art Thou, where uh, John Turturro, uh, Tim Blake Nelson, and George Clooney came together for the Nashville Film Festival to have a virtual conversation. Um, we had a discussion um, with Willem Dafoe about one of his independent films that we showed at the festival. So there was a lot of pluses to our virtual elements, and we were able to reach so many more viewers across the country and just garner more interest, um, on social media than we ever have in the past. Um, so this past October we went hybrid, um, and we did a bit of both. And I think, um, we are now kind of learning how to merge the two sorts of, um, land landscapes of how you can have a film festival. Um, and I think that I, I like virtual and I, and I think it's here to stay. I just think you need a balance of both. Um, our virtual selection this year will probably be a smaller, more curated selection. Um, but we will still have panels that are going to be virtual, um, panels that are in person. So, um, I think, I think it's just having a good balance and, you know, like Chris was saying, you can't really gauge, you know, how many people are going to show up in person, how many people are going to participate. So it's really nice to have those virtual options, especially when you record them to, to kind of spread, spread out and show people later. But I do think like, the virtual idea, um, is, is here to stay in, in some, you know, capacity for sure. And I do think that, uh, the pandemic has changed film festivals for the better and that I feel at least there's a, a bigger camaraderie upon festival organizers. And, you know, I've talked to people who organize and program film festivals that, um, you know, there was never that, uh, eagerness to reach out and like kind of collaborate and talk in the past. I feel like everyone was very, um, other festival organizers were just like very hush hush and like keeping all their cards to themselves. Whereas <laughs> now like the pandemic happened and we're all like, let's talk. Like, how are you running your festival? How are you running your festival? Oh, you guys did that. That's amazing. Or like we did that too. And it didn't work out so well. So I feel like that's been super cool is to be able to really work and talk with, um, other festival organizers because we were all just kind of winging it for a year. And mm-hmm. we, I think virtual and in person have caught their stride and are learning to work in tandem. It, it's so, fascinating to watch us. Sorry. Like, no, no, it's fascinating to watch it maturate and, yeah. and, and, and to see where we're going to go because the shortcomings of virtual can be dealt with by technology. So instead of having people watch a documentary or a film on your computer screen, maybe you have a nice 
27 inch monitor, maybe you have an iPad Pro, that's still not better than a theater screen. And, but you can overcome that or even a TV by just creating an app on an Apple TV or a Roku, that's the National Film Festival app. You click on it and then now you're able to watch the films Log in. It proves you have a badge. Yeah. Now you're able to watch the films on a big theater screen or on your big TV. And then you can even, you know, make a party of it, right. which maybe it costs the festival money in this soft dollar way, but gets exposure in a way that's un- immeasurable and, yeah. and potentially unlimited. So I think that's great. The other interesting thing that happens is, is the more people, the more that it, people embrace virtual, the more valuable in person it becomes. Mm-hmm. So, uh, historically, it's the executive who's inundated with filmmakers, uh, the lines going around the, the, the theater mm-hmm. one by one. Each person wants to get their shot to pitch this guy or gal. They never get out of there. And so it's really hard to like get them to come back and do it again. Um, but if more people embrace that virtual, now less people are in that line. And one of the most powerful things you can do as a filmmaker is to um, be quick and, and decisive with your networking. Hey, Christy, I know you work uh, for Showtime. I have a film. I've completed it. Um, listen, I know you're busy right now. I'm going to be around about 630. There's a restaurant right here. Let me buy you a drink. Whatever you're on me. What's your favorite bourbon? <laughs> simple, simple. Because the people that come into the festival want to eat and drink and be merry. Yeah. And most importantly, they want to see the city. Yeah. And that's why it has to be hybrid. Because if I'm, for example, a Willem Dafoe and you, you bring me to Nashville, that's totally different than saying, hey, I'm going to put you on a Zoom call with people who mm-hmm. live in Nashville. Right. But also people like George Clooney that are super busy, you might be able to get a Zoom call and exactly. actually have him at the festival <laughs> when he wouldn't ever maybe be able to make a trip. That's exactly right. It's right. like that's yeah. the pro of the virtual for sure. Yeah. Well, it's the and, hybrid model, yeah. Well, in the, uh, you know, in terms of like, uh, like distribution of films and different things, mm-hmm. I feel like, uh, you know, everything's changing. We're pivoting. Mm-hmm. There's new technologies being invented. It's a very exciting time, I think, to be an innovator in this in this area, especially because you know we're we're sitting here and we're kind of evaluating like the pros and cons mm-hmm. of the virtual versus in person, and there there are pros and cons. But you could probably like find that like sweet spot, like you're talking about, you know, where you have like maybe someone can watch the film festival like it's a movie, it's a live event, you know, it could be just a whole, you know, there's a lot of different things that can be innovated. No, yeah, for sure. I mean, like a pitch session. I feel like that's kind of maybe what we're talking about. If you have an idea and it's for a movie and, um, uh, you, you don't have all the pieces put together yet, but you have this idea, you have a log line, you have, um, maybe some type of work you can compare it to, or you have a script, some of a script written, a pitch session would be kind of how that should be received. Um, and actually the national film festival is, is bringing back the pitch competition this year, um, for log lines, um, for both features, uh, narrative features and, um, episodic web series, uh, work. So I think a pitch competition would be, uh, your, your best avenue for something like that. And so there's so many different festivals around the country that have pitch competitions. Do you think we could step back for a second and you could explain like the value of a pitch session for people that maybe don't know, mm. like what, it, what it gains you as a filmmaker? Yeah. I mean, and I don't know if you want to speak to this as well, but like, uh, uh, yeah, go ahead and Depending on, you know, the, the film festival, um, there could be different areas, uh, that they're, that they're focusing on for the pitch, um, as far as what kinds of genres and work they're accepting. Um, there's always going to be a jury of industry professionals there to evaluate the person, their idea, mm-hmm. um, how, you know, marketable and, and viable and, um, how much of an audience they think it could uh, garner. Um, there's always prizes for the pitch, whether it's a cash prize, whether it's, um, you know, in-kind stuff like like gear or editing software to get your project off the ground. Um, it's really kind of like 
what Chris was saying before, <laughs> when you go up to, um, you know, uh, an executive at like showtime or something, and you want to give them your, your most concise and, um, professional pitch to meet with you, the uh, pitches are the same thing. And they can vary in length and not time, but it's your, it's basically, you know, your elevator pitch for your project. And, um, it could end up winning you some cash or gear or, and it could also end up, um, winning you some really great connections and people that are, you know, willing to continue that conversation and maybe produce your work. Yeah, ex- ex- exactly. And, what I find interesting, so about 15 years ago, there was this survey done, and they asked people of all sorts of backgrounds and age ranges, uh, would they, you know, what do they fear the most? And people feared speaking in front of others yeah. more than dying. That's crazy. Really? Yes. They feared this more than dying. So that's why it's difficult. Mm-hmm. You know, we're going to give you some money if you do a good pitch. But then you have to overcome that initial fear to do it. Why did I bring that up? Because pitch competitions are practice for when you really got to do it. Mm-hmm. Your creative's on the line. Your yeah. house notes on the line. Your life's on the line. <laughs> and you got to get it. You got to win. But you didn't have any reps, so you're going to lose. So instead, do the pitch competitions. Get your reps. Yeah. Get reps on pitches however you can. I'm not immune to this. I was at a party with Lauren last week and I'm going around pitching our latest product. And then I turn to my team and say, how was that? Uh, you could have done this. <laughs> Be willing to accept co- feedback. If you're shut off to that and you're defensive and you're, you know, you, you can go on an ego trip, but you always fly alone. Mm-hmm. So take the feedback Continue to get better. That should be a t-shirt for all entertainment professionals. <laughs> <laughs> That's like, well, because, you know, I guess the artist's personality, they're, they're, they lean towards that direction sometimes. Flatten your ego. <laughs> take the feedback. Bring people with you. Well, and in the creative process is so collaborative mm-hmm. that, you know, if you are on a film set and you have one person who's kind of like has this ego trip or they want something a certain way and they're not willing to kind of make any kind of concessions it can destroy an entire project so but yeah. it can be as small you know and, and it's like a pitch but it, or it can be really big it is so true in this kind of industry mm-hmm. but i was i i actually Great. you know i pitch at festivals and your audience is people who want to help you or help you further your project Great. when you pitch to executives it's like you're in a room of sharks yeah. and you just have to wait for it so mm-hmm. it's really good to have a chance to do it with people who are kind of like there to support you and help you to, you know, figure out like how you can be in the room with the the next one, which you said something incredible there, which is that you go into the room with executives, which is, which how that works is it's not like an impromptu meeting at a festival. It's typically a scheduled meeting that you show up to with all your collateral, everything you got, and you're going to pitch your show. And the misconception a lot of times as a creative is, I'm going to give them a reason why. And what we're looking for is a reason to disqualify you. Mm-hmm. Well, that's why I said sharps because yeah. if you, because you go in, a lot of people go in, I kind of had a, a little bit of a, you know, some people give me a lot of good notes on, you know, going through it, but you think that someone's there because they were interested in your project and they're really there to poke holes and everything and ask you the most difficult questions and Mm -hmm. test you to see, you know, how flexible you'll be. But it's also, it's, you know, it's, it's the way you make a project. So it's Mm -hmm. one of the most important aspects that I think, I think that actually it's funny to me, you know, the festival helps with the programming to be able to connect you with a distributor, but then, you know, the filmmaker, the most important part of a film is that you are able to put it forward so people can see it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in terms of that, like with, you know, in general, but also with virtual, like how, how do you, how does the national film festival connect with different kinds of distribution options for filmmakers? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a little tricky. I think, um, something that we always do every year is we have a creators conference and it's our two day industry conference. And, um, 
we talk about topics in the industry that we feel that people, um, you know, are talking about currently and, and would find uh, valuable. And we always do a, a distribution panel and, and the goal for that is to uh, have representatives from different distribution companies come on and, um, you know, on all levels of the spectrum. So, you know, having some, some, uh, a distributor that is a little bit more high profile and then, you know, having distributors that really just like specialize in, in super independent work that, you know, might just go up on streaming and, or it's showing at, you know, a theater for a couple of days in New York and LA, that type of thing. So, um, I think through those types of avenues where people can join in and watch those conversations, um, and ask questions would be a great way. I mean, I think one of our goals is to make Nashville, um, a place where not only the Nashville film community, but, um, filmmakers, um, can come and actually have, you know, a discourse with, with distributors. I think that's one of our goals and, you know, with Nashville growing like it is, I, I feel like there's just so much demand here for, for, um, you know, people to be coming here and visiting and participating things. And then for the filmmaking community to show up, it's getting bigger and bigger. And, um, yeah, I think, I think maybe in the next couple of years, we'll have a lot more opportunities for that filmmaker to distributor That's conversation. Great. And Chris, I'd love for you to speak to, cause I know that you'll have a great answer. The, you know, the idea of connecting with distributors in this virtual world, the zoom calls and everything else. How do you have any thoughts on that? For filmmakers? I would say wear your mask, bring your hand sanitizer, get your vaccine, whatever it is you have to do to feel comfortable and to make them comfortable to be in person, it's going to be better. But it's going to be better. Are there any other opportunities? You know, oh, I was going to be that, oh, okay, but okay. I wanted to just start no, okay. with the truth. No, that is the truth. Which is get in front of them. Yeah. Um, we have people who fly to LA. They'll be there for two months. Their projects will be great or their auditions will be wonderful. If they're actors and the casting director or producer or executive will say, this was awesome. Let me know when you move to LA. Is anyone right? doing acting in here? No. no. Okay. So that's, that's part of the problem that we have to overcome. And Lauren was talking about people coming to Nashville now to its city. Mm -hmm. That's what's going to be, um, that's what's happening. 110 new people move here per day. Wow. Those people are creatives mm -hmm. and we can produce here. We can build our own community here. So we don't get, uh, the soft goodbye that I just, <laughs> that I just described. Now, in the, in the virtual sense, if, you know, virtual can mean a lot of things. So I want to define it, get some account that isn't FaceTime. FaceTime is awesome, but get an account that isn't FaceTime so that you can be on camera. So we use zoom. I don't own any stock in zoom. Lucky me these days. <laughs> And, uh, we don't, you know, it, it's, you can use teams, you can use, there's a hundred of them, but we use them and it is super duper powerful to be able to see the person because your, your, your brain gets and receives all this, um, nuanced information. I'm looking at you on screen, but I'm also noticing that your kid has a painting on the refrigerator in the background and I can infer something about what your life is really like. It's going to inform my decision-making. Simple. Okay. That's what it is. So the other reason why you do it is because you can schedule it and it can show up on someone's calendar versus calling them or FaceTime or something like that. Get a professional situation going that shows your face where you can have a good microphone you can put it on a calendar and then you can pitch you can pitch to to, to distributors who are by the way uh you know in a insatiable market there actually isn't enough good content to go around um 
because of the zeitgeist right now. There just isn't enough, you know, great content. And it's maybe so, so some, some great creators sitting here right now. It's yeah. funny that you say that because I actually just finished a film and they can, they're like calling me every day to finish like the few things for the distribution mm-hmm. because they're desperate to get it out. It's, but that's a great thing for filmmakers right now. So if anyone was thinking of doing their project or, you know, submitting, it's the perfect time. And I've actually, my first films, I connected with distributors at film festivals just randomly, you know, in the mixing kind of events or just kind of like, you know, they came to my screening and, um, but I did, I did actually ambush the president of HBO. <laughs> Good for he, you. Was at the, Good for you. <laughs> he was at the hotel desk yeah. checking in and, yeah. and I, I recognized him cause I used to work at, um, time Warner and I, I was like, Oh, I want him to come to my film. I walked up to him. I introduced myself. I invited him to my film and everybody came. It's amazing. <laughs> so it's like, but it's, it's kind of funny. It, I didn't like walk up to him unprofessionally. I didn't like interrupt him. You know, it was just like random, but I feel like, that's the in-person, you know, at the festival, all the filmmakers stay at the same hotels. So you meet all these other people, you meet all these people that are guests at the festival. So, you know, it's like a whole networking thing mm-hmm. yeah. and just, and it's really easy to kind of say, Hey, do you want to go grab a drink? You just sparked another thing, which is what's happening right now is first look deals. So, if you're a writer or a creator, filmmaker, um, go ahead and create an LLC for yourself. In the state of Tennessee, it's $300 uh, annually. And then they charge you some ridiculous nickel and dime fee to use your credit card and other things. Ridiculous. Anyway, it's three. <laughs> it's 300 Who can we talk to? Uh, it's, it's, three, it's $300. But you can start a production company. Production, my production company, LLC. And, you know, then you have to start writing things and creating things. But here's what I know, because the market's so insatiable. If you have three good things, you'll get a meeting with the top studios, Sony, A24, you know, you name it. If you have one great thing, you'll get that meeting for sure. So one great thing, three good things, you'll get the meeting and, and you'll get these first look deals, which don't guarantee you anything. But you put some money in your pocket so you can survive and keep creating, right? So you'll get some money, whatever you create, they get to look at it first and decide whether they're going to develop it or not. Do you guys know what a first look deal is? Well, I tried to explain it just then, but maybe I didn't go deep. <laughs> well, no, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I just feel like if you, no. they've never had that experience, maybe you could just do a quick uh, about like why you want It's that. a type of option deal. Right. So, you know, if, if you're in town with me, then I would just straight up option your script and say, I, I, you know, you're going to give me X amount of time to make this movie. And then if I can't make the movie in that amount of time, you get it back. You get the rights back. And then I pay you for that. Right. And locally, that could be. Five grand up to 50 grand, something like that. Uh, from a studio, you're going to get more money and uh, but not as much as like somebody with a name would get, frankly. But the first look deal is a little different where they're not actually trying to, uh, they haven't agreed to try to make it in a certain amount of time. They've agreed to, to restrict you to not showing your script to anybody, but then when it's done and the way you get that is by providing a writing sample or a project or a pitch, which we just talked about, Mm -hmm that is so compelling that they they don't want to let you go. Like you're, you know, they, they want to tie you up, say, Hey, whatever you make next, we want to be the first one to look at it and get the first chance to develop. That's it. And, uh, and then they pay you for that, but it's a contract and it has an expiration date as well. Just like an option. Sorry. Oh no. I, you, I was just say I was going to say, uh, we're, we're getting close to the end of the time on the panel. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Um, what questions? I was asking, like, when do you need an NDA when you, when you, you know, put your ideas? And then, second, like, how do you choose your films, and do you only look at the application, or do you look outside at like social media to get like, feedback? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, do you want to? I'll tackle. Um, I can answer the NDA if you want. The answer is one word. <laughs> no. 
Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, well, and, and did you want to answer the question about the film festivals? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of, there's two, there's two ways we program our films. Um, we get thousands and thousands of entries every year. Um, so there's a lot. So, um, one route we get them is straight entries through film freeway. Um, and I think I mentioned that platform before, and if you're not familiar with it, I would begin to familiarize yourself with it. It's where all the film festivals accept entries, including Sundance, Tribeca, all of them. Um, and, so there's those thousands of entries and I, I say personally, and I know my programming team does this as well. We do look at that extra, um, that extra information that filmmakers provide, um, the, uh, director biography, social media, um, news and articles. For example, if you have like an, um, a review in like IndieWire or Hollywood Reporter. There's places in Film Freeway to put that. And if you have that, I recommend doing it. Um, there's also a place to put where else your film has screened. That's something that I heavily look at um, for various reasons. I won't go down a rabbit hole as to why <laughs> I pay attention to that, but it's a, it's a big part of it. There's a plot, there's, you know, director statements, all of that stuff. So yes, we do pay attention to that stuff. Um, so that's one way we get films. Um, and the other way is from a direct programmer to sales agent distributor outreach. Um, and that is, uh, I'd say like our, our entries are, are the way we get our films is pretty much like 50, 50, um, with, with either route. Um, I think a lot for, you know, our features, um, we like to do our research and seeing what other film festivals are programming, what's doing well at film festivals. Um, we also look to a lot of European film festivals to bring kind of new perspectives into the programming here in Nashville. Um, so yeah, and we reach out. Um, so it's, it's pretty 50, 50, I would say, as far as how we, we choose those. Um, and when you were asking about feedback, did you mean audience feedback after the film? No, I meant, um, like, on, like YouTube, like this sort of thing on YouTube and like how many likes or like an mm. ongoing showing. Mm. Yeah. I mean, if a film is on YouTube, it's not going to be eligible to, for submission to a film festival because it's for public. It's already open to the, for the public to view. I think most film festivals, um, program films that have not come out to the public yet. Um, and that includes like if a film, if a short film is up for streaming on YouTube, it's not eligible. Um, so I'd say if there's a trailer, put it on YouTube. If there's, you know, a behind the scenes, like making of this project, put that on YouTube, put it on Instagram, put it wherever. Um, cause programmers, uh, do pay attention to that stuff. And distributors do too, because yeah. they want to see if you have a professionally packaged project that you're, you know, cause they want to work with people that'll deliver and that's yeah. a good sign. But, uh, so in your other question on the NDA, were you talking about to send it to the film festivals or was that the context? Or just like if you pitch your idea, like how do you, like just to, protect like to a studio yeah, protect to protect it. it. Yeah. yeah, I know. But then they go out. If it's a reputable production company or, you know, someone in the industry that's known, I don't think you have to worry about doing an NDA, but I, you know, I would be careful about giving away your intellectual property, which is what a movie is just if, and you know, I don't, with the film festival, there's like a, you know, code of ethics. They would never, you know, share your copyright work. Yeah. I feel like, uh, but like the people that work on your project or know about your project, you know, it's always good practice to protect your, you know, your production that way. Yeah. And it's important to know how the law works, right? So you can't copyright an idea, can't trademark an idea, so they can't steal it. And if they did steal it, you have no recourse anyway. Mm -hmm. But here's the deal. They would never execute it the way you would execute it. That's why you had Armageddon and Deep Impact. <laughs> the same well, movie it, 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 executed two separate ways. And by the way, they both did great. Um, but, you know, if somebody actually takes word for word um, dialogue and, and text from your screenplay and puts it in theirs and you're going to be fine because as long as yours was dated earlier, you have common law, right? And you can just simply show in court that yours was written before theirs was and you're going to win. 
You can go even further and mail 40 bucks to the WGA and then register your screenplay. So now it's doubly protected. I always do that because it's, it's, yeah, extra, it's yeah. extra protection and they fight for I'm, and they you fight know, I'm in the writers, room, so yeah. they, they fight for you if you yeah. have that problem. If you want to save a couple of bucks, do, mail it to the uh, to yourself in a sealed envelope to the Library of Congress or, or go, do it to the Library of Congress or put an envelope and mail it to yourself and never open it. Those are two of what we call like the poor, poor, man's poor man's copyright. copyright. <laughs> and they're very effective. Well, and, and the copyright laws, you know, when they actually go to argue them, I think it's like it has to be 80% the same. And that's a hard thing to quantify in a creative project. So it's, you know, if some like those two films, Armageddon Deep Impact, it's like they could never have a copyright lawsuit because they're not exactly yeah. the same. Yeah. And that's why they have those also like those spoof films. It'd be like deeper impact. And it was like, <laughs> so people would get confused thinking they were going to go watch deep impact. And then they left that one accidentally, but that was so profitable that that became like a sub industry. <laughs> but yeah. it's really funny. Yeah. You know, um, I, I feel like, you know, I've actually had people, you know, that find out this about something I was doing and, and try to make a project based on my idea. I really feel like in the end, it's not going to be as good. And it wasn't in that case then because it's not their idea. They didn't. It's like they have like the surface level of it, but they it's hard to execute like an idea unless it's like your vision. Yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you, Emily. Yeah, thank you oh, so much. This small group saw the best panel <laughs> today. Thanks to you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you, guys. You've been listening to the Make It Podcast. To find out more information about this week's topics, including links to relevant blog posts, projects, and indie creatives, please visit our website at www.banzai.film. If you haven't already, you can join our podcast community on Apple Podcasts or the podcast app of your choice by searching for Make It Bonsai Creative and the show will pop right up. You now have the opportunity to support the production of this podcast. If you love Make It and are a true fan of what we're trying to accomplish in the indie film community, please visit www.bonsai.film and click Contribute. Contributions start at only $5 monthly. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at underscore Bonsai Creative and on Facebook by searching for Bonsai Creative. You can provide feedback to us via email at contact at bonsai.film and you can follow me, Chris, on Twitter at Flaming Your Heart. That's F L A M E I N U R H E A R T. And of course, if you're looking to take a big step towards your filmmaking success, go to www.bonsai.film and click on Services to explore a variety of offerings from keynotes and panels to pitch readiness assessments and so much more. You have everything to gain. Until next time, be better, be creative, be engaged, and thank you for listening.